The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Good morning, Easter people. It is good and it is right that we are gathered and continuing to gather in this holy place, the sanctuary of our Lord. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Thank you. Welcome to worship this Easter morning at West Raleigh Presbyterian Church, where we, as always, are gathered in two places as an expansive and expanded family of faith. Easter is like this fabulous, movable feast where folks uh, that worship at West Raleigh on a regular basis are worshiping in other congregations with friends and families, and it gives us the opportunity to welcome some folks home. So we are glad that you were here. We also are always reminded that we have um, an expanded worshiping community that worships with us online. So we are glad that you are here if you are joining us remotely, whether it be just down the street, just at the edges of Wake County, or even as far as Massachusetts or Oregon, we are glad that from east and west and north and south, we are gathered as Christ's body. There is a friendship register, notice it is not a visitor's log, a friendship register on the inside inside aisle of each pew. If you're closest to it, I invite you to take it, pass it out to the outside, and then it can come back to the inside. We do really try to get to know one another better by names, by stories, and by faces, still masked, but soon not to be, um, so that we can continue to draw closer to one another and to God. If you're worshiping close by someone whose name you don't know, I hope that towards the end of worship you will introduce yourself uh, and get to know them better. Folks that are worshiping with us online, there is a bulletin in the drop-down menu on the YouTube page, and below that there is also a friendship register. We invite you to complete that so we know who all is worshiping with us as one body. I also invite you to look at the back of your bulletin for a couple of upcoming dates and information on West Raleigh Presbyterian Church, especially with an eye towards next weekend. You know, sometimes this is next weekend is thought of as a down weekend in the Church of Jesus Christ. Not so here at West Raleigh. We will be marking and celebrating Earth Care next Sunday, beginning with a native plant sale in the beloved Community Garden, which is just across Vanderbilt Street, um, and then with a whole feast and festival of activities before and during worship. We also are hosting an Explore West Raleigh class next Sunday that will start meeting at 9.30 and then continue after worship through lunch for folks that are interested to know more about the life of this community. If you're interested in that, you can email me or the church office. There are a couple of other dates for your calendar looking towards the spring um, and into the early summer as well. As we begin to move our hearts and our minds towards worship, I do want to make sure that everyone has a communion bundle. As you came, there is plenty for everybody to have one. If you need a communion bundle, raise your hand and one of the ushers can bring it to you. Looks like the Canes need one, Kari needs one. There are a couple over here in the front. Janet and Beth Harris need one. Keep your hand raised until you have firmly grasped. Yep, over here, the Dellingers need one until you have grasped your communion bundle. Raise your hand if you need a communion bundle. There is plenty for everyone to be fed. While those are beginning to make their way throughout the congregation, I want to note that they are made by our good friend, Sammy Otuti, who often um, caters events for us. We met Sammy six years ago, five or six years ago, at an interfaith festival that we had to welcome and get to know some of the people from Syria who at the time were beginning to make a new home here in the Triangle. Since that time, she's become a very close friend. Samia is in the middle of the feast of Ramadan, and so she woke up early this morning, broke her own fast, and then made our communion bread fresh. So it is a gift um, to be sharing in that bread in just a little while. We've got a few more over here, Donna. All right. Friends, let us turn our hearts and our minds to the worship of Almighty God.
north and south, east and west, far and near, let us raise our bodies and our voices in the call to worship. This is the day the Lord has made. Today is not like any other day. Today we slow down. Today we rest in good news. This day is not like any other day. Today we sing. Today joy cannot be contained or constrained. This day is not like any other day. Today the stone was rolled away. Today the women saw the empty grave. Today we know death does not have the last word. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia. Amen. It is our tradition, our habit, our discipline to move from that glorious song of praise into a moment of honesty and of truth. It's our tradition to begin worship with a prayer of confession, not to harp on ourselves, not to drum up internal guilt, but because we believe that we are clay in the potter's hands that God is not done with us yet, that each morning we wake up to be and to become a new thing. So I invite you to join one another before God in the prayer of confession because God is always listening. God's grace is always abundant. God's mercy is steadfast. Let us pray. God of new life, we are a patchwork of people. We want to be full of joy, strong in faith and abounding in hope. But often we overflow with anxiety and doubt. We want to embody the resurrection, but often we'd rather stay the same than begin again. We want to have the courage to be like the women on Easter morning, to run and speak truth, but often we are weary of courage and uncertain that our voice will make a difference. 
Forgive us for all the ways we remain unchanged. Break into our hearts. Break open our hearts. Overflow here so there is nothing we can do but bear witness to the power of your love. Family of faith, if there is life after death, then you can be certain that life lives and is abundant here. There is life after a mess. There is life after mistakes. There is life even within doubt and uncertainty. There is new life poured out for us each day, freely given, to be freely received, and to be freely shared so that all might have life and have it abundantly. Friends, hear and believe in the good news of the gospel in Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. We are a forgiven people. Know this, and may you feel that resurrected joy. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. I invite the children to come forward even as others are seated. Come on down. Y'all can come sit on the steps if you will. Did you all find plenty of eggs in the garden this morning? Some of you were there. There was a serious bunny who was a little toasty by the time the bunny came back in the building. Come on up. Hi, guys. What a crowd. Always fun. So last Sunday, um, a lot of people were a lot of different places, and it was a very special Sunday in the life of the church called Palm Sunday. Do y'all recognize that Palm Sunday? Don't recognize that? Yeah, it's it's the beginning of what we call Holy Week, and Pastor Catherine talked to us about a particular word, and the word was Hosanna. Does anybody know the word Hosanna? You know that word? Yeah, we shout it and we wave palms. Does anybody remember or know what it means? That's a long time ago. Week was a long time ago. Hosanna means save us, Lord save us. And the people in the parade back then waved those palms and they were so glad Jesus had come because they knew these stories about him and how he taught and how he healed and how he showed people love. And they liked the idea of Jesus showing the way instead of some of the leaders who were, didn't seem to care and to love very well. Well, the week went on and it was a good week except that because the disciples were together and people were celebrating a meal called Passover. Very important in the life of the people. Yeah, you've heard of that, Passover also. 
But as the week went on, things got really tense and some people got really angry because they thought their power was being taken away. They felt threatened by love, which just doesn't make a lot of sense. There's, a, there's plenty of love to go around. But you all know the story. As the week progressed, as the week kept going, Jesus got hurt and Jesus died. And we come to today when we celebrate something very important. And this day is called what? Palm Sunday. One more week. What's the Sunday after Palm Sunday? Who knows? Who'd say it? Easter. Easter. That's exactly right. And we get to bring out another word that has been tucked away for a lot of weeks. Last week, it was a very important word that was Hosanna, what meant save us. But but way back in February, some of you were here when we had these pieces of paper. Anybody remember these pieces of paper? Some of you. Campbell may be the only one. Thank you, David. Raises his hand. Other congregation members may remember. And what we did, everybody had one of these, and they wrote a word on here. You remember this, don't you? Do you remember what word we wrote on here? It's a word we've already heard a bunch today. Do you know? What is it? It's what? Is it hallelujah? Hallelujah? Is that what we wrote? We wrote hallelujah. Now, does anybody know what hallelujah means? Yes. Um, um, like God save us? Okay, well, Hosanna is God save us. And on the other end of it with the hallelujahs, it is praise the Lord. And that's why we, we're singing a lot of loud and saying a lot of loud hallelujahs because Jesus is risen, and we know that there was so much love that Jesus lives again and lives with us and for us and in us. Now, what Campbell may be the only one who remembers, what did we, oh no, you did, Emma Kate, you were here too. Do you remember what we did with these? Do y'all remember? It's a long time ago. We put them in a basket. You remember this? You remember where we put the basket? God, there's just been a lot that's been going on. It's up there in the sack. Uh, Pastor Catherine, go we'll, we'll open that sacristy door. Kath, um, Emma Kate and Campbell, y'all want to go back up there and see if that basket is still there? Everybody go look. <laughs> You can come see Mary. Bring it on out. I if promise it's, it's a very there. small room back here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you got it. Why don't you come on out, Campbell, so that we can look at it together. Yeah, come bring come it on. Come bring it on yeah. out. <laughs> there you go. All right. There's look, also juice and bread out there, so there may not be back for a All while. Right. <laughs> what, what did you find back there? What happened to the hallelujahs? They turned into a big chain. Come on, bring it down here and let's see. Hold the basket and let Emma Kate take this in. And you want to pull it all the way out and see what, you can bring it all the way over here and see what. There we go. Is that what y'all remember they look like? Oh, it comes out a whole lot different. Can you see the words on there? People were so creative. There were so many different ways that people wrote and, or drew or colored their hallelujahs. So they come out all different on Easter morning after we have had them very quiet over the last few weeks. Now, I will tell you, some of you who were here that Sunday, I told the story about Tom Lohr putting me in hallelujah jail. There's another pastor who went to hallelujah jail during the season. I will not name names, but we will. Um, she that. is free today to, from <laughs> hallelujah jail. There are many ways that we celebrate how we praise God and, and know the beauty of it. And you know where we see a lot of that beauty is in your faces. And we celebrate God's love. We celebrate God's love through Jesus. And we celebrate being together today in worship. And we celebrate in all the ways that God is going to... We explore what God is doing in new ways. And we continue to come together as Christ's body, doing new things and being in this good world. Let us pray. 
Gracious Lord, we do lift up our hallelujahs, be they very quiet or be they very loud. We are thankful to be gathered up to see these beautiful children, to know what gifts they are, and to see all these beautiful adults and know what gifts they are to each other and to all of us and to your body, to live love, to live into your love, to be your love in this weary old world. Help our voices be filled not only this day with hallelujahs and praise, but all the days of our lives. Let us offer our gratitude and praise to you. In Christ we pray, amen. Thanks, everybody. We'll put these, uh, we'll figure out a good place to put these. Maybe I'll put them over here around the flowers. Thank you. So we have children's worship for anyone that's like three or four and older, and maybe even everybody wants to go with Miss Donna is going to take you all down, and Eric Balkum is going to tell the story of Easter in a very special way. Mary is at the tomb with a story to tell. <laughs> Amen. I was thinking she's a preacher in the making. I think so. Working her way up here, right? Let us pray. Your word is light and life to us, gracious God. We hear the story, the oh so familiar words, but on this day, help us hear anew. Help us, yes, to be grounded in the story that has been revealed, but to expect, to hope, to know deep in our very being how you speak to us and dwell in us. It is in your precious name we pray, amen. Our first reading comes from the Old Testament. Listen to the words from the prophet Isaiah. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. But the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Our gospel lesson comes from Luke this morning, Luke 24, beginning with the first verse. On the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were still perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified. They bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. And then they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all of this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, 
Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter, he got up and he ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen clothes by themselves. And then he went in, amazed at what had happened. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. My mom has always had the pantry stocked with a pound of pasta, a special brand packet of Italian seasoning that I don't know the name of, but I could pick it off of a grocery store shelf, a jar of olives and Parmesan cheese. These essentials, along with a handful of cherry tomatoes and a cucumber if they're in season, are all mom needs for what is known around town as Bess's pasta salad. And growing up, if we walked in the door from school and mom was making this particular pasta salad, my brother's first question became, hey mom, who died? If anyone in our community experienced a death, they knew they could rely on Bess's pasta salad. My dad has been the medical director of hospice for decades. He has shepherded and coached families through that transition from life into eternal life for years. He has a whole vocabulary developed over time and season to help families fully understand what's happening and navigate what is sometimes the holiest of holy ground. He also has words, albeit they are fewer, with a steady presence for those times when death breaks into life and just snatches it away. My parents love people. They love life. They love God. And they've become really good at helping people through death. The church has the same habit. The church knows what to do when someone dies. Even when it's hard I can see us break through that hard and go and sit next to the ones who grieve, make phone calls, make food, send cards. We have the vocabulary of our faith that we draw upon, the vessel of prayer that we depend on, and a well-organized army of Presbyterian women and ushers who I can tell you will rise to any occasion. They have been called into service seven times since September, which for us West Raleigh is an unusual number. And each Presbyterian circle knows what to do. They know what to bring, and they arrive with such tender, strong grace, meeting grieving families with stories of that beloved and hugs. The same is true of that team of ushers who always arrive ready to create a gentle landing for family and friends who gather to grieve and give thanks. And since in the last year when we have returned in person for funerals, they have hosted all but one of those receptions outside. Jane Stewart would would be smile for hers was the one inside. Ushers have hauled heaters to the courtyard to keep people warm, and Presbyterian women have bundled up and trudged through the wind and the rain and the cold with plates of food huddled in a tent inside the courtyard with the flaps up to try to keep it COVID safe. This is all hard and tender and holy work, and the church would do our best to do it well. Just like the women who met on that first day of the week at early dawn, they knew what to do when someone dies. They had gathered the spices. They had prepared themselves likely with prayer for the pain. Some had probably gathered in the shadows of that night to recount the story of what happened to Jesus because that's how they process grief, while others had likely not spoken to a soul. But at dawn's first light, they knew what to do, and they knew what they would find when they got there. And they knew they couldn't wait any longer, and so they took a deep breath, and they went out into the cool, dark, dawning light. Together, 
because no one should have to face the reality of the valley of the shadow of death alone. They went together to anoint and to dress Jesus' body. Not only did they grieve at this deeply personal loss of a friend, but it was also the death of a dream. Jesus had convinced them that there really was a different world out there waiting for them. That things didn't have to be they were, the way that they were. That the world could be turned upside down so that the first would be last and the last would be first. A way where everyone shared what they had because they could trust that there was enough to go around. A way where families and communities that had been fractured for all kinds of reasons could be repaired and restored and made whole. A way where the powers and the principalities that seemed fixed and immovable, protecting only themselves, could change and actually be in service of the people. But that dream had died, or so they thought on Friday with Jesus. Things had not turned out how they had hoped, but again, they had become used to that, and they knew what to do. They knew how to move through grief, They knew how to feel its pain and feel their way through it, to sit sometimes with the silence, to listen for its wisdom until that time when life would return to normal. Reminds me of these last two years, right? Sitting and waiting for a return to normal. Two years ago, It's really crazy to even think about it, but two years ago, we had hoped that we would return to the sanctuary for Easter Sunday. Instead, you remained huddled at home while we live streamed here in the sanctuary. The magnitude of the pandemic was just beginning to unfold in real time. We celebrated Easter with Davie Street Presbyterian Church that year, longing together to return to normal. Last year, we thought we were almost there. The vaccine rollout had begun for healthcare workers before Christmas, and the general population was beginning in greater volume to get their shots. After a rained out and very disappointing Christmas Eve, we had a glorious, albeit very complicated, Easter. We Eastered on Horn Street. From 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., holding three outdoor services in addition to the pre-recorded service that dropped at 11 a.m., I woke up this morning thinking, wow, this is kind of a simple Easter Sunday. Have we missed anything? We weren't there quite yet, but the end was in sight. We thought we could see that light at the end of the proverbial tunnel, and then Delta swept, and then Omicron swept, and here we are two years later back in the sanctuary, hallelujah, after two scattered years, grateful to be flowering the cross and singing our hallelujahs, stringing them across the front of the sanctuary. But here's this human paradox or irony with this moment. We don't have to dig too deep or go too far to recognize and realize that in many cases, we're actually more weary than we were this time last year. We're actually a little bit more anxious than we were this time a couple of years ago. And cynicism has eaten its way into our hearts in ways that we wish we could just push it out. We've begun to understand that we're not going to return to normal. We can't unsee what we have seen. We can't erase the experience. We can't get back the time that we lost the people that we loved, or the dreams that we had dreamed. In her article on preaching this year, professor of preaching at Luther Seminary, Joy J. Moore, admits that for her, the journey of Lent towards Easter this year feels more different than other different feeling years. So I wonder, I wonder if when the women reached the tomb, if they sensed that this time... That death, Jesus' death, might be different too. I wonder if they remembered the promises that Jesus made, the bread that he had multiplied, the people that he had restored to life, the communities that he had repaired and restored into wholeness. 
the taste of the hope in that bread, the flavor and the smell of the grace in that cup. I wonder if as they clutched those spices, ready for the sight of death, even before they knew it, something inside of them began to break open when they saw the stone had been rolled away. Luke says that they were perplexed, at least for that very split second before the angels appeared. And that perplex and perplexedness, I'm not sure what that word should be, gave way to fear. But it's interesting. Notice they didn't run away. They dropped to their knees. This wasn't the kind of fear that induces fight or flight. This was awe and wonder and surprise. This was the beginning of joy rising from a place that they did not know existed. From somewhere unseen to welcome them. Why do you look for the living among the dead, they said. He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that he would be handed over and crucified and rise again on the third day? And then they remembered. It all came flooding back to them, and they rose and they returned. Even in utter shock, writes one commentator, they return to their deepest knowing that allowed themselves to receive the expansiveness of resurrection. This was not going to be a return to normal. This was something new. And Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women, they rose in and to, and by that moment, they took the news and they ran with it. They ran all the way back to the apostles who were sitting with their own grief still weighing them down, and they told them everything, just as it had happened. But the world, the words fall flat, Luke says, The words seem to those apostles like an idle tale. Words, words that were so much more than words, seem to them an idle tale. Now, there could have been many reasons that they reacted the way that they did. They, too, had lost a beloved teacher and friend and leader. They had pinned their hopes and their dreams on Jesus, and he was gone. Maybe they were done with hopes and dreams, too angry to entertain hope. Maybe all they could do was hang their harps by the river. Maybe they were weary. Maybe they were too exhausted by the last three years, the last week even, to think there was any reason to hope for change. Maybe they were overwhelmed. Maybe they were overwhelmed by how much still needed to change and how it could be ripped away so quickly. Any potential for transformation seemed to them an idle tale, just words. Maybe they had become cynical just overnight. The powers and the principalities that had proved to them, at least in that moment, that might would trump right, and there was nothing they could do about it. So cynicism began to eat at their edges or even reach their core. Angry and weary, overwhelmed and cynical, reduced the news of the resurrection that the women carried to an idle tale. And friends, if that can happen to the apostles who had met Jesus, who had walked with him, who sat at table with him, And sometimes angry and weary and overwhelmed and cynical can do the same to us. In addition to a global pandemic, we've been wrestling with a long laundry list of powerful threats to the health and strength and wholeness of our community. We've come to understand racism as an endemic threat that permeates all of public life. Climate change continues to pose an existential threat. Political divisiveness makes all of this even harder to navigate. And the geopolitical situation is volatile, complicated, and frightening. All of this, whether you take it alone as one piece or as a whole, can drive us to reduce the possibility of resurrection, of anything akin to health and wholeness and healing rising out of this ash heap, 
to an idle tale that's hard to believe and even harder to practice. But the story doesn't end there. In walks Peter. Peter, upon hearing what the women had to say, remained curious. Peter, who had every reason himself to be angry and weary, overwhelmed and cynical, breathed through his defensiveness, stayed steady and in his body as those self-protective reactions and emotions must have flipped through him like a Rolodex. And then he got up and he ran to the tomb. And stooping to look in and see for himself, he saw the linen clothes dropped and by themselves. And what he discovered changed the way he saw and understood the future. He too rose to his feet and ran towards the future where he was sure that resurrection happened. Like the women who knew that they had to let go of what they knew in order to walk into what was next, Peter doesn't return to normal. Instead, Peter returns home. Peter returns home to a faith in his risen Lord, home to who he is in the world, home to who he is and amazed at what is possible. Amanda Gorman is that poet laureate who captured the American imagination since she recited her inaugural poem, The Hill We Climb from the Steps of the Capitol Building. Since then, she has published a book of poetry and a children's books, and her words are alive with hope. Not only does she have an incredible, phenomenal command of words and language, she has this ability to float them together so that they at once sing and paint and probe and challenge and they live all at once. I was thinking about why her particular poetry has filled us so much these last two years. And I wonder if it is because she has this capacity to go straight to the hardest and most tender and wounded and broken parts of our life together and name that truth, honor its history and its presence, and then open it up with this incredible potential for discovery, for transformation, and for grace. In April of 2020, during one of the hardest, during some of the hardest and earliest days of the pandemic, Ms. Gorman wrote, I thought I'd awaken to a world in mourning, heavy clouds crowding, a society storming. But there's something different on this golden morning, something magical in the sunlight, wide and warming. While we might feel small, separate, and all alone, our people have never been more closely tethered. The question isn't if, isn't if we will weather this unknown, but how we will weather this unknown together. So on this meaningful morn, we mourn and we mend like light. We can't be broken even when we bend. Church, on this Easter morning, we bend to the light. We rise to our feet to meet this new day not in anticipation of a return to normal, not even a new normal, not with answers to all of our questions, but with wonder that we have made it this far, with curiosity about what will come next, and with hope, because the women and the apostles and Peter, with them we have seen the very place where death happened is now the very place where we witness resurrection. May we discover the living Lord new every morning. For he has risen. He has risen indeed. Alleluia. I'm out of jail. Amen. <laughs>
Shannon, please be seated. It is so amazing to look out and see faces that we have not seen in a while, and I hope you have had a chance to look around also and know that is a part of our offering of this day is to be in one another's good company. There is also another portion of our offering that is to hold our prayers of joy and concern with and for one another. You see a number of those celebrations and concerns in your bulletin and now on the screen Continually, we are called to be in continual prayer together, and we rejoice. We add these prayers to the ones that you already see before you and have been holding in prayer. First for Rebecca Leggett's brother-in-law, Eddie, who is recovering from cancer surgery. We are thankful that that is a successful surgery, and he is doing better. For Pat Myers and her family on the death of her husband, Lyle, this is, um, this, he is the son-in-law of Barbara and Jerry Carlson. And I don't, Carlson's, are you in the house? Thank you at the back, mindful of you all during this time. And we also, um, because there are always these, these hard things we hold and the joys that we hold, we celebrate with Matt and Kara Leggett. Where are you all? Are you all still in the house? Happy anniversary today, number 12. Wonderful that you would be with us. Another portion of the offerings we share, I hope that you've had a chance to read the bulletin insert either this week or last week and read about the great hour of sharing. This is one of the offerings we are um, participating in along with the wrappers for the quarters that are for Afghan refugee families. Um, there are still some of those wrappers in the back if you want to take some. This will kind of conclude this next week, conclude our season of both raising the quarters and the great hour of sharing. You know, it strikes me that the Alleluia chain, for those of you who were here before, they were just these single strips, right? And many of you wrote on them. And it was so fun to look at all the different ways that people wrote their alleluias and how different they look all connected together and how important both the individual and the collective is. And so I want you to take just a moment to think about all the ways in the last weeks or months you have lived out your gratitude and your praise from the gifts and the offerings of your lives whether that is in the meals, like uh, Catherine mentioned, the ways that hospitality has happened, whether that has been sending in um, a check, whether that has been uh, visiting someone, whether that is simply how you live your gratitude in the ways that you work and you dwell um, in your neighborhood and in other communities. So for just a moment, how have you lived out your gratitude and your alleluias this season? If we could see all of those lifted up, it would fill this place. And your generosity and the ways we do live out our gratitude is a part of our gift that begin in the, in the grace that has been poured out to us and for us and upon us. So we are people, we are Easter people who live in gratitude and live in hope and are um, in this season again lifting up our alleluias. Amen.
Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west, from north and south, to sit at table as the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Savior was at table with his disciples, he took bread and he gave thanks and blessed it and broke it, and it was in the receiving of bread that their eyes were open and they recognized him. Sisters and brothers, siblings in Christ, this is a holy feast. It is prepared for everyone. Everyone. The weary and the worn, the ready and the reluctant, the tired and the tender. For around this table, we will rise to new life. We will be repaired and restored to a new community. We will be made in to disciples, friends, one body. Beloved of Christ, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. God of the garden, God of new life, God of the here and now, our hearts are full, full of hope and fear, doubt and belief, dreams and uncertainty. As a result, our prayers can often feel chaotic, bouncing around to each name and need that comes to mind. Settle us so that you can startle us and summon out of us what we shall be. Lift our prayers from the ashes of our distracted minds and hold us close so that we can behold your beauty. God, there are some things we would like to release, things that we'd like to bury, things that we do not want to bring with us into this new day. In particular, we'd like to let go of our weariness and anxiety. We like to be less overwhelmed by the world and more nourished by your grace. We'd like cynicism to let go of us so that we can love one another more fully. These things are always easier said than done. Holy One, which is why we need you. We need this bread that rises fresh every morning. We need this cup abundant with grace. For these are holy things to make us holy, and so we sing. Draw us closer to the life of resurrection you offer, the abundant life we rise and run toward. Move us into closer balance with creation and one another, closer to health of mind, body, and spirit, to justice that sets our hearts on fire and to your word lived out in our daily lives. Help us. Guide the way. Meet us in the garden. Roll back the stones that stand in the way. Grant us the energy to rise and to run, to be gathered up into your expansive love until the promised day when swords are beaten into plowshares and the prayers of your people are only prayers of joy. 
We ask that you pour out your spirit upon this bread and this cup, that we might catch a glimpse of you here at this table. Until that promised and glorious day, we continue to pray with disciples and saints of each age, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus sat at table with his friends, the disciples. He took bread, gave thanks to God, blessed it, broke it, and said to each one of them, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant that is sealed in my blood that has been shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink of it, you do this in remembrance of me. The Apostle Paul added with words to the church, every time you eat this bread, and each time you gather to receive this cup, you proclaim the saving grace of the risen Lord until he comes again. Friends, these are holy things to make us holy. Come, let us keep the feast.
Let us pray. Jesus, at this table, we remember and we mourn. But gracious Lord, at this table, we remember and we mend. On this light-filled resurrection day, bend us to the light of your love and your grace in all the ways that we live and as we follow your mandate to love as you have loved and to love one another for this feast that we have shared in this community of care midst all the saints of light. We lift up our gratitude and our praise this day. Alleluia. Amen. into the world in peace, have courage, hold on to what is good, return no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, and help the suffering, honor and serve all people, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessings of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer be with you, with everyone who is dear to you, and with those who are known and dear only to the heart of God. Friends, go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. And having been released from Alleluia Jail, may all of God's people say, Alleluia and Amen.